The Jerry Powell Podcast is brought to you by Archstone Foundation, improving the health and well-being of older Californians and their caregivers. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. This is Eric Quadera. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, who do we have with us today? Today, we are honored to welcome Mike Wasserman, who is a geriatrician and provocateur and immediate <laughs> past president of the California Association of Long-Term Care. Welcome to the Jerry Pal podcast, Mike. Great to be here. Look forward I, to it. I am super excited because A, I watch all of your videos on the CalTCM website, uh, including the recent one around vaccines and vaccine hesitancy. I also... Like every day that you're in some other national newspaper. Uh, today, you just said you were in what again? The Washington Post. Washington Post. Mm-hmm. Today, we're going to be talking about kind of where we were, where we are, and where are we going with long term care and COVID. Mm-hmm. But before we get into that subject, do you have a song request for Alex? Yeah, you know, I, I was I was saying I I played guitar when I was a teenager and I loved Elton John and I always loved the song Sixty Years On. Mm-hmm. I haven't really really thought about what it meant, but that doesn't really matter. Being a geriatrician just seems like the right thing to to do. Great choice. Um, it is a little. Uh, I have no wish to be living sixty years on. <laughs> it's a little bit pessimistic about. I know, <laughs> but we'll 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 give it a go anyway. Here we go. I'm just gonna do the first verse. Who walk me down to church When I'm 60 years of age When the ragged dog they gave me Has been 10 years in the grave And senorita play guitar Play it just for you My rosary has broken my beads have all slipped through. Sixty years of age, man. So you are know, you sure that's not Zeke Emanuel is singing that? I I, <laughs> I I actually have a story about that. I'm not sure I can share it, but uh, uh, but but it's funny you say that. But it, it actually brings me back to when I was 16. So that's kind of where that yeah impacts yeah. me. Yeah, well, we, we love taking favorite. Uh, requ- you learn you learn about people by the songs they request, and uh, and sometimes it's related to the times, and sometimes it's just you know a favorite band from when they're in high school, right. which exactly. is a lot of fun to listen to as well, and to learn. So thank you. So, Mike, big thank you for joining us uh, again. I, I'm hoping that we kind of talk about kind of where we were, especially like February, March, April, with COVID and long term care, where we're at right now. And kind of where do you see things are going from here? So maybe taking a big step back, um, let, let's go back to like when did when when did COVID start affecting you and long term care? I'm trying to even remember the yeah. timeline anymore. No, I this is Im- embedded in my brain <laughs> in in ways that um, I, I can't even begin to describe. February 29th was when I read about Kirkland, Washington and the nursing home and began internally freaking out. And literally over the next week, I started thinking, oh my God, what's gonna happen? Um, And a lot of it is, you know, being a geriatrician, having worked in long-term care for three decades, but also I ran the largest nursing home chain in California. So I know sort of every angle and, and actually, on March 5th, uh, over a year ago, I reached out to the California Department of Public Health and said, you need us, CalTCM, to help do infection prevention training. Hmm. And, um, and they said, oh, that's all right. We've got this covered. And, you know, m- maybe you guys should do a webinar. So th- literally three days later, we did our first webinar. Um, which I'm, I'm proud of. We, we, mm-hmm. we responded um, immediately. Um, within a week or two, we actually recommended that the governor mandate every nursing home in the state to have a full-time infection preventionist. And that's sort of kind of how that evolved. That's, that's probably the real pivotal moment. Somewhere in that first couple of weeks, I sort of put my CEO hat on. 
because I'd run a, a large nursing home chain. And I said, if I was still in that position, what would I do? Mm-hmm. And I remembered a couple of years earlier, we had had a meeting where we talked about our infection preventionists and the fact that they didn't have time to do their job. And I'm thinking, okay, most nursing homes in the country, well, actually all of them have an identified infection preventionist. Almost none of those people are given the time to do their job. And we are about to enter a pandemic that... And keep in mind, if you were paying attention to the rest of the world, you were reading about how what devastation in Italy and Spain was being left in nursing homes in the wake of COVID. Mm -hmm. And so, honestly, I was freaking out. And I actually spoke on, on March 9th last year. I called my parents who are in their 80s and I said, don't leave your house. Mm. And I was actually quoted by NBC News a day later saying that this was going to be the worst thing that we had ever encountered in our lifetime in nursing homes. And so what, if my memory is correct, so the the big surge starts happening in March and April in the U.S., specifically in New York City. And um, I forget what happened. Uh, nursing homes got a ton of PPE and support from the government, and uh, they were prioritized just as much as hospitals. Is that right? <laughs> Boy, you know, I, that's an altern- that's an alternate universe. Uh-huh. Um, you know, what really frustrates me as we look at the future, even as we sit here today, different studies are showing anywhere from ten to maybe 20% of nursing homes around the country still don't have adequate PPE, Hmm. which I consider unconscionable. So yeah, I mean, supply chain dynamics, no one had enough PPE. They didn't have testing available. Um, And actually by the end of March, we had gotten a hold of a bunch of test kits from, uh, the city of Los Angeles for for the nursing home I'm medical director of. And we tested all of our residents and staff and found that we actually had COVID, which Mm -hmm. isn't surprising. Mm -hmm. We also gave a couple hundred of those test kits to another nursing home in Los Angeles. They tested all their staff and residents and found out they had a massive outbreak. Um, like 75% of the residents were positive and 90% of the staff were positive wow. and almost none of them at that moment were symptomatic. Yeah. And they literally locked down, got everyone on PPE, sent people home, quarantined, did everything. And the interesting lesson we learned from that experience was even though they had an outbreak by doing everything right, right away, they limited their mortality to around just under 10%, mm. which for such an outbreak back in the early days of the pandemic was a remarkable achievement. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we had a we did a podcast with uh, Jim Wright and David Grabowski in the very beginning of April, where mm-hmm. Jim described his uh, experience at Canterbury Rehab Center in Richmond. And they were just absolutely devastated in part because all the, a lot of the staff left, all the physicians left. He, as the medical director, was really the only... He was delivering food to people's homes or into people's rooms as a medical director. And it just sounded like my heart just broke for him and all the patients in these nursing homes because there was just no support. No. And the, the other thing that was going on in March with me, guys like Dave... Um, other folks from Connecticut, Washington, Virginia, elsewhere were calling me, Philadelphia. I actually heard about the first outbreak in a Philadelphia nursing home before the media, before anyone else did. And, you know, I was sort of semi-retired at the time. And I've been around for a long time. I know a lot of people. Folks just started calling me and telling me what was happening. And I... In some regards, I felt that an obligation to do something for my colleagues. You know, I had one colleague in Philadelphia who told the story that uh, there was a code 
He was the only one who had PPE on. He was doing a code by himself in PPE because no one else had PPE. And again, none, and, and, and then other folks would call me and tell me they wanted to order testing on their residents and they were told they couldn't. Yeah. <laughs> I and person, that's what I remember from, from that podcast with Jim was, uh, you know, a lot of that focus in March and April was test symptomatic patients. I specifically remember like from that podcast, like if you got, you know, five patients who test positive for COVID who are symptomatic, that means you have five patients who are asymptomatic who are yes. test who would test positive. And we knew that at the very we knew that at Mar- the end of March and the beginning of April that asymptomatic carriers were a fair well, amount of these patients. We knew it as clinicians. We also knew it if we just read the MMWRs coming out of the CDC in the middle of March. And the New England Journal, by the end of March, it was all published. And yet, the CDC and CMS weren't acting on their own information. And can I ask you another another big thing? I remember specifically, this was a Mike Wasserman specific, is that early on, New York, elsewhere, hospitals, people were really worried about uh, overcapacity. It's certainly the surge hit hospitals, open up ORs. Um, and there was a big push to send COVID positive patients to nursing homes. Yeah. And we freaked out. Um, my, my boss at the, where, where I, where I'm medical director, uh, he and I both were like, if anyone tries to do that, we're standing in front of the door and we're not letting them in. Mm-hmm. Um, actually Cal TCM, our board voted on a resolution that said on March 19th in response to what was happening in New York and what was happening at the time in California, because the governor of California was about to do the same thing that Governor Cuomo did. And we passed a resolution that said, hell no, <laughs> mm-hmm. you can't do this. Um, and I'd like to, and AMDA then passed a similar resolution. And I'd like to think we had some uh, responsibility for keeping that from happening in California. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, even to this day, that whole thing has become political in New York, and mm-hmm. you know, what what brought the virus in? And mm-hmm. and I actually have found myself saying, look, sending infected people certainly into COVID naive nursing homes still doesn't make sense to me. Mm-hmm. It just it, you don't do it with this virus. Yeah. Um, granted there were staff coming in with the virus because they were asymptomatic and not being tested. So, you know, which was more, I don't know, but it doesn't matter. Both of them kill people. So, you know, I, I think it was a big deal. And um, I'm proud of our colleagues for uh, many of whom around the country literally stood up and said, you know, we're, we're blocking the doors if you try to send us COVID patients. Yeah. It's just not, there are, I'm just, think, you know, stepping back and thinking, what are the meta lessons to be learned from this? And listening to you talk, Mike, one is about the, uh, you know, turning away from nursing homes, the lack of resources, the lack of PPE testing being funneled towards the location that was arguably the ground zero for mortality in COVID in the United States. Um, and then the other story is one of perseverance and struggle to stand up for nursing homes from people like you, from organizations like California Association of Long-Term Care and um, other leaders around the country um, fighting against this um, you know, policy shift and uh, government um, decrees that might be harmful towards nursing homes. I wonder what your thoughts are on sort of the, the meta messages, you know, thinking back a year. Yeah. I became a geriatrician officially in 1989, mm-hmm. trained by some incredible people, Joe Auslander, uh, Dave Rubin, uh, Dave Solomon, you know, y- y- you name it, uh, Larry Rubenstein. I've been working in nursing homes almost that whole time I've been advocating for geriatrics and long-term care medicine and and such for over three decades. No one cared until now. And I I think to your point, all of a sudden, the fact that 
people are dying in droves got folks' attention. And, and I think there's a silver lining to this whole pandemic. It's that finally there's a spotlight on nursing homes, on vulnerable older adults, with the caveat that that spotlight was really strong last March, April, and May, when ironically, if you really look at it, the smallest number of deaths occurred. Mm-hmm. It, it's and it's a little frustrating. So, you know, we were we were talking about it and being heard about it, and then sort of the political winds took over here in the U.S. and nursing homes went off the news. So, I, I think I would encourage all my all of our colleagues. Mm-hmm. Um, we do have to be willing to be advocates for our field. And if there is a profound lesson in this, mm-hmm. you know, you said I was a provocateur. I've, mm-hmm. I've never been shy for yeah. people who know me um, about speaking up. So I, I remember a year ago, I tweeted out something like, you know, ageism and racism equals elder genocide. Yeah. And I, I have some, some colleagues who are like, oh my God, you're, you know, that's really provocative. Yeah. The crazy thing is, here we are a year later, and some of those very colleagues are tweeting out things much more provocative than what I did. Yeah. And, and so I, I hope, actually, no, I don't hope. There's been a groundswell amongst our brethren who are willing to speak up. And I think, you know, we're, we're more, we like consensus. We don't like conflict. That's what geriatricians are all about. But we're, we're in the big leagues. We're, we're dealing with the government, with the nursing home industry. Mm-hmm. And it's a contact sport. And you've got to be willing to speak up and speak out. And the thing we have going for us is we are passionate mm-hmm. about what we do and we care. Yeah. And people get that. So I, I think we are in the right place at the right time. I, I wish it weren't, you know, and we'll talk more about where, what's coming ahead. But, but I think that's the key is we finally got to focus on what we do. Yeah, I think, you know, just to build on what you're saying here about speaking out, and part of this is speaking out for people who generally don't have the opportunity to speak for themselves. Not only are nursing home residents generally less likely to speak out for themselves than other members of our society, but also part of the reason they often end up in nursing home, nursing homes is because they don't have a caregiver support. Uh, in the home setting to stay at home. And so they're less likely to have caregivers who will speak out on their behalf as well. So it's, it's you know, you have this extremely vulnerable population um, and who doesn't have a voice. And so it's just so critical that, you know, people like you and other people, Dave Grabowski, you mentioned, others, you know, Joe Auslander, stand up and um, and give voice to the concerns and the needs of those most vulnerable folks. Yeah, Dave and I, Dave Grabowski and I joke, we are, it, when, when there's an article out there, it's, it's like he and I are often quoted together. And we, we actually published a paper together um, uh, last month in the health affairs blog on the need for transparency in, mm-hmm. in nursing homes. And, and, and that's the other thing about the nursing home industry and this pandemic, it's, allowed us to talk about things that no one had really talked about. We, the advocates are always talking about the bad things that go on in nursing homes, but no one had really discussed why and what the underlying root causes were. Yeah. And those root causes are really coming out now. Mm-hmm. So, and I, I think silver linings to hopefully be able to address these things. So, over the course of the the following year to where we are right now, 40% of, I think, COVID deaths were in nursing home patients in the U.S. Um, luckily, you know, December, January, there was a prioritization as far as vaccinations to, to nursing homes. And the number of deaths in cases in nursing homes has 
plummeted. Where do you feel like we are right now, Mike, as far as COVID and long-term care? Well, we're in the best place we've been in in a year. Um, the vaccine has been everything that it was supposed to be. Um, you know, if we get the residents vaccinated, if we get the staff vaccinated, the profound and precipitous drop in cases and deaths in nursing homes is incredibly telling. Um, now, I really have str striven for a year not to look backwards, except where it helps us look forward. And for all the great things about the vaccine, what we did was we spent billions of dollars to create a vaccine, kind of dropped it off on the front door of nursing homes in December and said, good luck. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and so there wasn't really a lot of planning. We saw this coming. We actually had a group that was trying desperately to make recommendations. And I have to say, the thing that hasn't been reported on, if we had been able to effectively roll out the vaccine in nursing homes and assisted living facilities and group homes in December, you're talking tens of thousands of preventable deaths. Mm -hmm. Well, so, how, how did you actually, how would you rate the rollout, like the, the long term care pharmacy, I forget the, the entire title, the, the CVS Walgreens thing. How would you rate that rollout? Honestly, I give it a D minus. And, and the reason I give it a D minus is how can I not give it a D minus when we knew what an A looked like and the difference between an A and a D minus was 30, 40, 50,000 deaths. Okay. I mean, that's the bottom line is if you'd done, if we'd done what West Virginia did, yeah, which is what we were recommending from like October on. Which was go through local pharmacies. If I remember West Virginia, is that right? Yep. The long-term care pharmacies. Every nursing home has a long-term care pharmacy. Yeah. Get them the vaccine. Get everyone vaccinated right away. West Virginia had had their vaccinations done almost by the end of the year. And look, we're still, as we sit here today in California, there are still assisted living facilities that haven't completed their vaccinations. Hmm. And in those facilities live people with Alzheimer's who don't wear masks properly who can't physical distance. And so we missed, we missed an opportunity. Now that said, it's water under the bridge. What's done is done. But looking forward, um, we actually have a group of folks who have been meeting weekly since October that have just penned a letter that's going to go to CMS and CDC by the end of the week saying it's not too late to engage all those long-term care pharmacies so that as we move forward, we're going to have new admissions who aren't vaccinated. They need to be vaccinated. We're going to have staff turnover and we have to have staff who have now decided I want to get the vaccine. So in order to maximize the level of vaccination amongst residents and staff, it is way past due that we fully engage the long-term care pharmacies and, and also make it easy for them in the facilities. They're, there should never be a situation where someone says, well, we can't do that because we've got to do this or we've got to type this in or we've got to fill this out. You know, when I ran my nursing home chain, I had two words I didn't, I didn't allow. Those words were can't and won't. Yeah. And um, I, I believe during a pandemic, when you're talking putting vaccines in the arms of people, the two words that should be literally abhorrent to you are can't and won't. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's you got to figure out how to do it. And right now, uh, we just did a vaccine hesitancy podcast uh, published uh, two weeks ago. Um, but you know the the numbers that were striking to me is eighty yeah, percent of nursing home patients uh, has, have gotten the shot, but only about fifty percent of nursing home staff. Does that sound right about to you from a California perspective? Yeah, no, we and we knew this. Anyone who took the time and energy to, to think about it back in October knew this was coming. And you'll still see folks, public health officials say, oh my God, we didn't expect this. Why aren't they? And it's like, well, get your head out of the sand and, you know, and listen and listen to the experts in geriatrics, which by the way, to me for, for literally the last 13 months, that has been my mantra. 
engage geriatricians, engage mm-hmm. experts in geriatrics, not only on advisory committees, which many of those are just bullshit, but mm-hmm. can I say that on the podcast? You can Please. say that. The earmuffs for all the kids out there. <laughs> um, but but we need to be in the room. I mean, and, and look, I would if there were wildfires running through the state, the governor would be standing there every day with a fire chief. And we've had a wildfire running through our nursing homes for a year. And it still frustrates me that the governor is not standing there next to a geriatrician every day. Mm-hmm. And, and honestly, that goes for the, the, the feds, that goes for many states. Yeah. Um, and, and, and if they had, the reason I went around on that little tangent, we all knew that our, our frontline staff were going to have issues with vaccine confidence. Um, by the way, that's one of my pet things I've learned from some of my colleagues. I, I, um, I try to say everything with positive words. People mm. don't like negative words. So not hesitancy, vaccine confidence. Mm. So, so we want to improve vaccine confidence I see. instead of talking about vaccine hesitancy. Yeah. And, and by the way, those numbers are coming up. I just saw a study today that, uh, you know, we may be getting closer to 60% acceptance in the frontline staff. I, when I got my vaccine at my nursing home, I talked to some of the staff and they said, yeah, our colleagues are nervous, but now that they're seeing me get vaccinated, they're getting willing to do it. So I think, I think we're going to see more and more acceptance of the vaccine over time. Yeah. I mean, it's still a little bit shocking because like me and Alex live in Marin, which I think 50% of adults over the age of 18 have gotten at least one shot. This is all adults. So to hear that we're just, you know, at the best place, you know, 10% higher for that for healthcare providers, it tells us that we have a lot of work to do around vaccine confidence. I'm learning vaccine confidence. You know, I think the other thing we have a lot to do around is, so the three were, again, this, I'll, I'll credit um, Lisa Coleman uh, for this. We need to respect, honor, and value our frontline staff. Yeah. yeah. And so if they don't feel respected and honored and valued, why are they going to just jump in and take a brand new treatment? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so I think, you know, this is why I've been against mandates for these staff, because I want my kids growing up in a world where the frontline staff of nursing homes are going to get vaccinated out of their own choice, doing what's right, rather than to be coerced. I mean, these are people who barely make a living wage if they're lucky, often work two jobs. I was on a press conference yesterday, and there was a CNA who talked about literally going home crying every night because the lack of staff to take care of the residents and she's running around doing it. These are the most compassionate human beings. And even though as a clinician, I would love to just say you're getting the vaccine as a human being, I can't do it. Yeah. That was from our, our vaccine work we called it hesitancy podcast where uh david gifford asked and said because we, we asked him about like should we just mandate it and it really he came down to it and it will destroy trust if you mandate it it will destroy trust. Plus, plus it probably wouldn't work because there's so many ways to get out of it um but uh, fundamentally this is about building trust rather than destroying it so i've been i've been trying to avoid this topic again out of the spirit of being positive but we started vaccinating nursing home residents in December. We don't have a clue when immunity begins to wane in 50 year olds, much less 90 year old nursing home residents. Mm-hmm. I'm shifting to what's going to keep me up at night. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry to think about the future. And, and, and the question is, or that maybe the, the answer is, this is why we have to remain vigilant. We have to keep wearing masks. We have to keep testing because if we, if we, you know, there's a lot of folks who are like, oh, we got vaccines. We don't have to test. No, nothing could be further from the truth. 
All right, my question though, do we have to continue the lockdown of nursing homes? This no. social isolation. We can't. And that was where that was my quote in the Washington Post today. I think uh, it might have little been a little edgy, not surprising for me. Um, <laughs> I, I love you always give good headlines. That's what I've always loved about reading you in, the, in like the Times or LA Times. Oh, that was oh, that was a provocative statement by Byron. Well, I'll give a clue to you and all of our colleagues. If you want to be quoted in the newspaper, you have to be a little edgy. You have to be a little provocative. Otherwise, they're not going to use your quote. Now, the, the most provocative quotes have landed me on TV. And the moment I get on TV, I pivot to being a geriatrician and giving sound, respected answers. And, and I think, you know, we, again, we're not trained with this media stuff. And, and I think there is something to it. But, um, but back to the, the visitor. Yeah, sorry for the tangent. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's fun. Um, here's what I've been telling people. We have 90-year-old nursing home residents who haven't seen their loved ones in a year who are vaccinated. Some of these folks have 90-year-old spouses who haven't seen them in a year who are now also vaccinated. How we don't have the 90-year-old vaccinated spouse from the outside, not only visiting, but hugging their 90-year-old loved one in the nursing home, while we still have that 90-year-old nursing home resident being taken care of by an unvaccinated staff member mm -hmm. is, is beyond me. And so I think the data is abundantly clear that vaccinated nursing home residents should be allowed to see visitors. Mm -hmm. and, and that guidance is actually now out there, but they still, they still put between the guidance and the fear in the industry, yeah. you're still hearing people say, okay, that's true, but let's only, let's try to focus on outdoor visitation, which I'm fine with. And to your point, you, you can visit between 11 and 12 when it's not raining on a Tuesday. Right. Right. I mean, where has person centered care gone mm. in the last year? Right. It doesn't exist. Mm. Person centered care would suggest if Mrs. Smith's, you know, grand, grandkids want to come and visit, mm -hmm. you know, they should be allowed to, we have yeah. to, we have to figure out how to make it happen safely. That's mm -hmm. the key. And, yeah. and, and it kind of goes back to your earlier point. Paternalism has reared its ugly head in many ways in the pandemic. Everything we've done is to protect the residents, mm. regardless of their wishes, quality of life, and desires. And, and I think that's the lazy way out. So science tells us the vaccine works. Science tells us there are safe ways of visiting. Mm -hmm. We need to bend over backwards to make it happen because these folks have put, I mean, they've been, this is Normandy Beach. And for some of them, it's Normandy Beach the second time. These folks have been on the front lines of this pandemic, giving their lives. And what are we giving them? And and yeah, I mean, I, I, you can tell actually a lot of the visitation advocates love my tweets <laughs> because I am, I am unabashedly pro visitation, but I also will tell people you've got to do it the right way. And I think that's the key. Yeah. What, what was the quote in the Washington post? Um, actually my quote in the Washington post had to do with the fact that I gave this quote probably a couple of weeks ago now which is a little dangerous during these times because two weeks is a, a lifetime. Um, when the guidance from CMS came out and CDC and California Department of Public Health, there wasn't internal consistency. And so there was a lot of confusion and there still is a degree of confusion there. And so I, I think, and, and I, 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 I did also note, honestly, that facilities are in fear of more outbreaks of getting sued, of getting penalized. So 
You've got CMS saying one thing. You've got your state health department saying something else. These guys get penalties based on whether they get it right. So we can't have that during a pandemic. I, I think that's been our the thing that has frustrated me the most is, you know, one of the things what some of my great mentors in long-term care have taught me is the concept of always trying to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And that's natural for us in geriatrics. And I, and, I, and I think if the government could find a way of understanding that and filtering it through their regulatory process, we'd probably be better off. And when you think about kind of where we are now, what are the other things when you think about the other nine months of 2021 that we have to look forward to? What, what keeps you up at night? What are you worried about? Where do you see COVID going as far as long-term care and how our response to it changes? So I was telling, I, I think I was telling someone, I, I don't want to be the, look, a year ago I was telling folks, we could see a quarter of a million deaths in long-term care. No one published that quote. They thought that, you know, I've been out there. They thought I was out there. They thought I was nuts. Hmm. That number is going to be pretty darn close to the truth. Yeah. And so what worries me is between variants and people thinking, oh, I'm vaccinated. I don't have to wear a mask. I can let my guard down. And waning immunity. And the fact that unlike flu season, where we try to get everyone vaccinated in a fairly tight period of time, we've got people vaccinating throughout the whole year. I have to be concerned that we can't stop wearing masks. And, and, and my, my dad's 86. And the funny thing he told me about a month ago was, you know, I haven't gotten the crud this year. I normally get the crud. It puts me out for like a couple of weeks. And he says, you know, I'm wearing a mask for the rest of my life. <laughs> and, and I do think we have a cultural issue. Just look at Japan. You know, I, I think we have to mask wearing needs. Look, look, I am never getting on an airplane again not wearing an N95. Mm. Um, and the irony is I, I did the Hawaii Ironman in 2019. Wow. And I got sick the week before. Oh. And, you, you know, in retrospect, I wished I'd worn a mask mm -hmm. for like the two, three weeks prior to the event. But you finished the Ironman despite being sick the week before? Oh, yeah. that That's is, a whole other story. That is impressive. <laughs> Um, it's, it, there is a theme here about it's a people's voices not being heard again. Um, you know, who else would be in, uh, tolerate being confined, solitary confinement essentially for a year. And, uh, as you're thinking forward again, you know, Dave Grabowski tweeted the other day, um, what this has, what this pandemic has showed us is the long-term care system is broken. It's broken. And that's clear. Um, Normally, we give people a magic wand with one wish that one thing they could change. I feel like in your case, we should give you a genie, like a uh, one of those, you know, vases or whatever it is that you rub the magic bottle, and then the genie comes out, and then you get three. You get three wishes. You know, the genie will grant you three wishes to change the long-term care system for the better. Um, what would those be for you? So the first wish would be, I'll take a little liberty with this one, to instill geriatrics training throughout medical education. So starting in medical school, carried out all the way through residency. Mm -hmm. okay? And the reason for that is my second wish won't really matter if that first wish doesn't. If we don't have more of us who understand geriatrics and more of us who can teach it and practice it, then the second wish is, is not going to matter. And the second wish is geriatricians, again, not only need to be making recommendations, we have to be in the room with policymakers. And I think on a very pragmatic level, I don't think there's ever been a political appointee 
at CMS or HHS who's a geriatrician or who has a strong geriatrics background. And those are the guys who make the policy. We have geriatricians working at CMS. They're great people, but they carry out the policy and the regulations that the the, the bean counters and the lawyers and the MBAs give to them. And none of those folks understand what we understand. Mm-hmm. So that's my, that's my second wish. My third wish is that we can all as human beings just care about each other mm-hmm. and wear the damn mask. Because <laughs> because honestly, if we look back over the last year, if as a country, everyone had followed mask wearing and physical distancing from the beginning, we would be more like Japan and not Brazil. Well, Mike, first of all, I want to really thank you for joining us on this podcast. Um, your leadership and your willingness to put your voice out there over the last year was inspiring to me and I think has actually made a ton of important changes um, in how we care for you know, a population that is in some way by design ignored by most people in the US. Mm-hmm. So they don't have a voice and... Um, their family members often don't have a voice. I love that you were willing to put yourself out there as a voice. And really to all of our listeners, um, just loved your lessons to uh, Mike on how to be that voice. Um, so big thank you for joining us and for being who you were this year. And thanks for doing what you guys do. Love your podcasts and uh, just keep it up. Um, any, any quick resources that you just want to plug as far as... Um, uh, long-term care and COVID? Well, um, go to the AMDA website, go to the CalTCM website, follow me on Twitter, at Wastoc. Um, and, and, I, and I promise you, 95% of my tweets are related to geriatrics, long-term care, aging. I really try to avoid politics, except when they're egregiously ageist. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, encourage everybody to follow Mike. Uh, David Grabowski, another great one to follow. I loved his recent tweet. Uh, I think it was from yesterday. Uh, he was on a panel discussion and his quote was, the US has more nursing homes than Starbucks. And then Nathan Stahl, another great person to follow if you're interested in this subject. Canada has twice as many Tim Hortons as nursing homes. And it's <laughs> unclear if this reflects a relatively supply issue of Canada nursing homes versus just their love for... Tim Hortons. So those are great. <laughs> uh, Alex, do you want to give us a little bit more of that song? You've hung up your great coat and you've laid down your gun. You know the war you fought in and wasn't too much fun. And the future that you're giving me holds nothing for a gun. I've no wish to be living 60 years on. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Mike. And big thank you to all of our listeners for continuing to support the Jerry Powell podcast. Um, and to Archstone Foundation for your ongoing continued support. Good night, everybody. Good night.